they're very sculptural plants and they're fantastic horticultural plants for desert gardens. So here, agave distribution, I missed it just a little bit um, on the northern edge here. It goes up beyond Las Vegas. I didn't quite get it far enough north, but basically it gives you the idea that it's southwestern Arizona or southern United States. There's a little bit into Florida. It's mostly Mexican, uh, some in Central America. There's a, a handful in Northern South America. And then the Caribbean ones, which I have not been able to study yet. And I'd like to take up a collection to send me to the Caribbean to, <laughs> to, to study the agaves, of course, just to study them, not, not vacation or drinking rums or anything like that. It's purely all research. Okay, tidbits part two. This is the important part. So there are two basic inflorescence types and the inflorescence is just where the flowers occur. So there's what they call the spicate and a paniculate and we'll look at examples of each of these. And then there's a third that's intermediate between the two types and they usually call that a racemose type. And again, we'll look at some pictures of these. <clears throat> So here's a spikeate type. Spikeate are when all the flowers are grouped uh, on the main flower stalk itself. So if you can see my cursor here, you can see all the flowers on this very tall stalk uh, and they're coming off of a short pedestal <laughs> and, and grouped together onto that stalk. And here's a paniculate type. Uh, oh. this, is, this is narrowly paniculate. So the side branches are very short and here's one that's a little more broadly paniculate. So mm -hmm. you can see the flowers are clustered at the ends of these branches. Mm -hmm. So those are the two basic types. And then the racemos type has these really short uh, stalks with the flowers clustered at the end, but there are many, many, many of those stalks as opposed to our, sorry, let's go back here. So you can see the, the racemose type is similar to this, where there's all these stalks or all the flowers on the stalk. And they're a little bit different than the paniculate type, where there's just a few flower stalks. <clears throat> a few side branches with the flowers clustered at the ends. So this is usually indicative of, of hybrids between the two different flower stalk types. Okay, so part three, uh, there are two basic vegetative types. There's solitary and there's offsetting. So this would be a solitary type, agave shadigra, does not produce any babies around the base of the plant. Here's another solitary type, agave avalanidans from Baja, California. So there are no babies down here at the base and nothing occurring in the leaf axles. So they're all single rosettes out there in the desert. Another one, Agave Montana, uh, solitary. Again, no babies around that one. Here we have an offsetting type, Agave striata. And this is, you can see this huge clump here. These are all, they've all started from one main plant and then uh, they produce offsets and, and keep growing and make bigger and bigger clumps as it goes along. Now this is, um, well, we'll still get into uh, whether they die or not, I think in a minute here. Here's another offsetting type. You can see the individual rosettes are much bigger. <clears throat> Let's see, maybe if I move, I've got so many windows open down here at the bottom um, that I'm missing out on some of the slides, but let's, Okay, uh, Okay. so uh, Gavi Tidbits part four. So there are two basic leaf types. There's a narrow leaf type and a wide leaf type. And all these characteristics are independent of each other. So the flower, flower type or inflorescence type has nothing to do with whether it offsets or not. And it has nothing to do whether they're narrow leaves or not. 
So here we have agave geminiflora, has very, very narrow leaves, no teeth on the edges, but they're instead replaced by these fillipers or marginal threads. <clears throat> then we have a wide leaf type, agave bobi cornuta. Uh, you can see how broad the leaves are. And this one happens to have some very cool uh, marginal teeth on there. Okay, part five. Few agaves are true desert plants. They're mostly found above the desert proper and even some growing with pine trees at very high elevation. Um, Agave Montana, which we saw earlier, was up around 9,000 feet elevation. Uh, many of them grow in full sun in their native habitat, while others are in the shade of trees. Some grow on flat or gently sloping ground, while others have adapted to growing on vertical cliffs. Okay, so um, all in all, they're great landscape plants. Let's take a look at a few. And they're all arranged alphabetically here. Well, actually, they're, they're not. They're alphabetical within size categories. So I've broken the size categories down into these five basic categories. Extra small, less than 12 inches across, small 12 to 30, uh, medium 30 to 48, large 48 to 60, and extra large um, over 60 inches. So less than a foot for, for extra small, uh, one foot to two and a half feet, two and a half to four, four to five, and over five feet. To give you a uh, general idea there. So let's look at a couple of extra small agaves. Here I have three of them identified for us. Albopilosa, Ismensis, and Parviflora. So agave albopilosa is one that, that likes to grow on cliffs. <clears throat> and it's a really cool one because it has really neat tufts of hairs at the ends of the leaves. And you can see these white markings on these. Let's see, I can do this. There we go. Um, so on that particular plant there, you can see the, the white markings. So those are little fibers that the plant has mm -hmm. that have that expand uh, as the as the leaf gets older. Uh, mm. And nobody knows what purpose they serve. Uh, I think that it's a, a trick played by Mother Nature to hide the terminal spine. So you think it's all soft and fuzzy and you go touch it, the spine is in there and it, it pokes you. I think that's the only reason they're there. It's just to be a, a Mother Nature's playing a joke on us. <laughs> um, so albopilosa is one that will offset sparingly, and it takes a long time to eventually produce those offsets. Um, it grows in these cracks of limestone that we can see here. And you can see there's a couple of uh, plants on this one. There's the, the main plant here. There's one offset, and I think there's even one in the back that we can't see there. But they're small plants, usually about 12 inches or so in diameter, and very slow growing. Uh, this was discovered, uh, I think it was described about, I want to say 12 or well, maybe about 13 or 14 years ago, and seed became available in 2010. And I've been growing, I grew a few of them from seed. I had to buy it from an uh, outfit in Germany, I believe it was. And it was very expensive seed to get at the time. And it's very difficult to get the seed. So I can see why it was expensive seed. Uh, the a, next a one here is- A question uh -huh. about Albo Pelosa. Uh -huh. is, is it suitable for the landscape? It looks so specialized. Well, these small ones, um, you'd have to have a small landscape really mm. to, to have it. Uh, I wouldn't put it in, in the landscape here in Tucson unless I have a really small yard. These, the extra small ones like uh, Albopilosa, Nismensis, and Parviflora are better suited for container culture. Okay. Um, and they're grown on, you know, grow them in a, a nice decorative pot on a patio. They do very well that way. <clears throat> okay. So here we have agave ismensis. This one is from uh, Southern Oaxaca. And it's a very, well, for me, it's a little frost sensitive. Uh, so again, 
best grown in a container. I can put it on a covered patio. I can bring it into a greenhouse, keep it protected in the winter time. Um, I suspect high 30s or high 20s, uh, like 28, 29, 30 degrees is about its limit for frost tolerance. So if you get colder than that, you're going to want to protect this one. Mm -hmm. Here's another uh, form of it. And it grows on the slopes, not real steep uh, slopes like, or vertical cliffs like the Albopilosa does, uh, but kind of hard to hike around on slopes. <clears throat> and these individuals, they may get a little bit over 12 inches in diameter. Uh, but usually right around that foot or so. And it does produce offsets. Uh, there are two basic forms. There's what we call the coastal form, which is this one here, produces fewer offsets than the inland form, this type here, which produces a lot of offsets around the base of the plant. Mm -hmm. And the, the inland form tends to be a smaller rosette than the coastal form. So there was one called Agave Kichi Jokan for the longest time. And uh, I've come to the conclusion, I'm not 100% certain, uh, just 99% certain that Agave Kichi Jokan, which we see here, uh, was derived from Agave Ismensis. The flowers are, are almost identical. The plant looks very identical. It was just something that, uh, hit the horticulture market about, oh, I'm gonna say about 25 years ago with just the, that cultivar name without a species name attached to it. But uh, with some research, I've, I've finally figured out that it's most likely agave ismensis. Okay, then we have agave parviflora. This is an Arizona native, perfectly cold hardy for us. Uh, but it is one, again, that's very small non-offsetting for the most part. It may produce a few offsets. Uh, so it's best used as a container as well, container plant. Uh, again, no teeth along the leaf edges. Uh, instead has these very uh, coarse marginal fibers uh, there. Okay, small agaves, a little bit bigger than 12 inches. So uh, usually about 15 to 30 inches uh, are these guys here. So we'll look at a, a representative sampling of, of those plants. So agave bracteosa, this is another limestone loving plant. Uh, you have to get to these limestone hills in northeastern Mexico near the town of, or this big city of Monterrey in Nuevo Leon. And uh, that's where agave bracteosa likes to grow. And here you can see, uh, on the vertical cliff, here it is in flower. It's got these cool white flowers on it. Uh, and it grows in these lime, in the cracks in the limestone. And it produces a lot of offsets, very soft leaves, no marginal teeth, uh, a very, the terminal spine is hardly noticeable at all. It's really soft and flexible as well. Uh, but it's a very interesting plant. Again, perfectly cold hardy is from Northeastern Mexico. Uh, this is one that you could plant in the landscape because it gets big enough uh, that it'll be noticeable and not get swallowed up by other plants. Just another shot of it growing on the limestone cliffs. Agave colorada. Uh, this is one from Sonora, Mexico. And it'll get about uh, to the, the larger end of that small size range. So about two feet for this one. <clears throat> Typically in habitat, they're, they're solitary plants. Uh, this is one that we brought, brought into cultivation and they will be heavy, heavy offsetters at some point. But beautiful blue gray leaves with this really intriguing cross banding that we can see uh, on leaves like that and over there, you can see that really cool cross banding. <clears throat> so this is a great landscape plant as well can take full sun, uh, no problem with the cold for even us here. And I've been down to uh, the high teens, so it's been able to take that. Here it is being used in a, a kind of a raised planter at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. 
you can see the overall shape here is a little bit more urn shaped, uh, a little bit more upright than a lot of the other agaves. I love it when it was used, uh, this was at the uh, Phoenix uh, Desert Botanical Gardens. They used it in their wildflower garden and it was a spectacular combination with the pink uh, Penstem imperii and the powdery blue leaves it was a really striking combination. <clears throat> then we have agave Parasana. This is from near the town of Paras in uh, Coahuila, Mexico. Grows up high in elevation, around five or 6,000 feet, maybe a little bit higher than that at, at some point. Uh, another oh. one that, that is typically solitary in habitat, uh, but occasionally in cultivation, there are forms that will produce a lot of offsets. Uh, so, you know, look for the solitary ones. Uh, they're beautiful sculptural plants and about two feet in diameter and about two feet high. Very cool marginal teeth on these guys. You can see the, the long teeth uh, right on, on these leaves here. And they make cool bud imprints uh, on the leaves. That's one thing about agaves that are really interesting. Uh, let's go back here. You can see the, the bud imprints. Uh, if you can follow my cursor. So you can see the leaf outline of the leaves uh, that are either before or after this leaf. So this imprint was probably made by, I'm going to say by this leaf here. Uh, this imprint was probably made by this leaf here. So it'll make the imprints while it's in the bud stage and they'll, they'll uh, make the impressions. And then as the leaf unfurls, uh, they'll be remain, remaining on the leaves and visible on the leaves. Mm -hmm. So that's just another cool factor about agaves. There's another agave parasana. And again, you can see the bud imprints here. And sometimes it'll cause color changes. Uh, so we have a little bit more powdery blue and a little bit greener here because of the leaf that was imprinted. I'm gonna say this imprint was made by this leaf here. Just another spectacular looking specimen of agave parasana here. As you can tell, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Makes a great combination with yellow flowers, again, with pink flowers, uh, just, just about any flower, flowering perennial or small shrub uh, makes a good combination with this one. <clears throat> I had a nice grouping in my, my own landscape here. I think I had like five of them planted out uh, and they've eventually died out over the years. I don't mm -hmm. think I ever had one flower even. Um, I think a gopher got in and started chewing the, the roots off and killed the, the plant. So it was kind of a, a shame because I had some really nice forms. I had, uh, I love the teeth on this one. They were uh, much closer together. And then this one had really big teeth on it. So I was kind of saddened to, to lose that. And I'm not sure what to do about the gophers. <clears throat> Oops. So here we have agave shadigra. Occasionally, this one will uh, produce these unusual colors uh, from red to purpley red, and then the new leaves will be green as it comes out. So this is a solitary plant, no offsets on it, and it gets about two feet in diameter. Here's one that does not have the colors. So it's just a, a random occurrence. It could be something maybe related to drought stress, maybe to the full sun, uh, but uh, I'm not so sure on that because both of these plants, the previous one and this one, were in the same area, subjected to the same conditions and everything. Do we have a question? Nope. Okay. Um, here's one in a landscape. Again, you can see used with flowering perennials, penstemons, things like that. Uh, they make great combinations uh, with those perennials. And I love agaves uh, because they're sculptural and they're there 
12 months out of the year. They don't change so much. And you can use things that are ephemeral, like penstemons or for us, desert marigolds. I don't know what you have in the way of perennials um, in your area, but you can have these low growing things that, that are there ephemerally or seasonally, and they'll uh, add splashes of color uh, to the landscape. And then when they're gone, you have the agaves and, and your uh, sculptural plants to carry the area through. Okay, here we have um, agave striata. And it's one of those that does produce offsets. And we're talking about the plants that don't die after flowering. And agave striata is one of those that does not die. Um, what happens is it'll produce um, offsets in the leaf axles as it grows along. And uh, so like this one flowers out here, it'll produce offsets in the leaf axles, in the upper leaves of that plant, and it'll make a big cluster. Eventually that rosette, uh, all the leaves in that rosette will die off or get covered up by the other plants. And if you recall the, the huge cluster of agave striata we saw earlier, that absorbs all the, the rosettes that die off. So each rosette will still only flower once, but in the case of agave striata, it's uh, just like any tree or shrub that when it, if it flowers at the end of the branches, then the, uh, uh, the axillary buds will produce the offshoots. And that's basically what's happening on here. Not, not many agaves do that, but just a few will do something like that. Here's a uh, silvery blue leaf form of agave striata. It's very variable in the color uh, from uh, lime green to yellow green to dark green to this blue purple, uh, red purple, silvery blue, <clears throat> uh, quite variable. Here we've got the purpley red form. This is down in Hidalgo, Mexico. And then Queen Victoria agave. Uh, this is another one that's a, a small plant. It gets about a foot, maybe a foot and a half in diameter. Uh, sometimes there are forms that will offset very heavily when they're young plants. And then when they hit their teenage years, they stop offsetting. And then as they get older, just ready to flower, uh, they'll produce a lot of offsets again. Um, I guess they go into panic mode and say, oh, I'm about to die, so I better produce more offsets and some babies to keep my, my genetic pool going. Well, that's pretty. Yeah, this is a really nice one. I've, uh, I've seen landscapes here in Tucson where they had uh, dozens and dozens of these planted out. Uh, so you can use them grouped together like that. Uh, solitary as, as a very sculptural plant. It's a, a really intriguing one. Again, you can tell one of my favorites. It's one of mine too. Are there any tricks to growing it? Like how about water, for example? How much water does it need? Can it get too much? Yes. Um, so that's one thing we should talk about. Watering of these things. If you grow agaves and you, you get a way to grow them, don't change it. I mean, I've, people are always asking me, what kind of soil do you use? And I've seen them growing in soil. I use a lot of pumice sometimes in mine. Um, I've seen them growing in a heavy peat moss soil, uh, peat moss and perlite. Uh, I use peat moss, um, compost, and pumice. Um, it's just, you kind of have to figure out what works best for you in terms of soil and watering. Uh, you don't want to keep them soggy wet. You don't want them to go bone dry for a long period of time. Um, evenly moist kind of is the best thing. They can stay on the drier side, uh, but some agaves will accept a lot more water than others. Uh, and it's one of those things you just have to kind of play around with that. Same with like sun exposure. Some of them, um, where you guys get, what's your summertime high temperature like 
you know, we're, we're approaching the kind of temperatures that Las Vegas is famous for. And we didn't used to get that here, but it's getting really hot in our summers. Okay. So you're climbing. 110. 110. Oh boy. You're approaching Tucson temperatures then too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so yeah, you'll need to give them a little bit. A lot of these will need a little bit of shade in the summertime to get through those 110 to degree temperatures um, or if you grow them in full sun they'll need just a little bit more water uh, mm -hmm. to get them through the, those hot summers and then what about winter winter lows we're we're technically winter warm winter wet so uh, the lows here can dip below freezing mm -hmm. this winter has been pretty mild so far Okay. But, you know, usually we stay above freezing. And if we get a hard, hard freeze that lasts a couple of days, that'll happen maybe every 10 years. Okay. So with the winter wet, uh, you want a soil uh, component that drains very well because they don't like wet, cold, cold, wet roots. Uh, so keep them on the dry side in the wintertime. Some people... They can grow the, a lot of agaves in North Carolina. And one thing that I've heard people will do is they'll put up temporary uh, like plexiglass structures over the plant itself to keep excess rainwater off of the plants. Uh, other times people will do raised beds. And here at, at the Desert Museum here in Tucson, they did a cool raised bed here with using boulders and rocks. And then... Uh, lifted the soil and did a, a nice porous soil so that the excess moisture will drain away. Oh. Okay, medium sized agaves. So about two and a half feet to four feet in diameter. <clears throat> so here's uh, four of them that I chose to look at today. Agave bovi cornuta. Um, one thing I like is the way a lot of the botanical names are devised for these. So if we look at Bovi Cornuta, I'm not sure if I have the breakdown here, but we'll do the breakdown right now. Um, if we look at, let's see, yeah, there we go. If we look at the teeth, so what what's Bovi? Cow. Cow, and Cornute is? Horns. Horns, yeah. <laughs> so the common name is cow's horns, and if you look at some of the, the leaves, you'll see one tooth curling in one way and the other tooth curling in another way. And they look like cows on a horn or horns on a cow. Um, you know, if you go out on the range in Texas and see the steers out there, that's what their horns will look like. So I thought that was a very appropriate uh, way to uh, give this one its botanical name. <clears throat> That was a Sorry. beautiful photo, by the way. Is it oh, in the thank book? you. Is thank it in you. your book? Uh, I think that one is, yes. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, so Bovi Cornuta is a solitary plant, and it grows in the state of Sonora here. Uh, I thought it was going to be frost sensitive, and it's been down to the mid to low 20s with no damage at all. So it's a little bit hardier than I had initially given it credit for. Here it is growing under a whole bunch of deciduous oak trees. And these are deciduous uh, up until the, the time the summer rains hit. So this picture was taken in the middle of June. The oak trees look like they're dead. But you go back uh, two months later after the rains, and those oaks are in full leaf and giving a lot of shade uh, to this area. Just another shot of uh, Bovi Cornuta. And then here we've got the cow's horns again. This one is actually a hybrid uh, between Bovi Cornuta and Agave Colorada. Uh, but I just like the color combination with the green mm. leaves and the yellow flowers. I thought that was a very good use of color. Mm. Agave Havardiana. This is one from Texas. And it gets uh, medium to, it can creep into the large size category mm -hmm. but it's a beautiful color on this one very stately plant 
uh, stout leaves. I mean, they have no give whatsoever. So you don't want to fall into this one. <clears throat> They're very stiff uh, and very lethal with that terminal spine. So they'll grow out in the uh, juniper zone in West Texas. And they're basically solitary plants like we see here. But they'll take full sun. They're very, very cold hardy. <clears throat> this is one of those uh, people in oh, Colorado have been using this outdoors and uh, they've had good success with it. So Havardiana is probably one of the most cold hardy agave species we have. <clears throat> and then agave multifolifera. So if we break that name down, we have multi, which is? Many. Many. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the name, filifera, refers to these filifers or threads on the on leaf margins. So many threaded agave here. And this, this one actually is really living up to its name. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Makes those of us who are a little follically challenged uh, jealous. <clears throat> Here's a nice grouping of three of the multifoliferas. They're solitary plants. Uh, they have stiff leaves, so it's closely related to the agave shadigra, uh, but it gets to be a little bit bigger, a little bit taller, uh, a little bit more rounded plant than the shadigra, which is a little bit lower and wider uh, than this one. <clears throat> so even though they, they have very similar appearances uh, with the individual leaves, they're different. Um, different forms overall once the plants get to be a full-size plant. <clears throat> it's another one with a lot of threads on the leaf margins. Then agave perii, uh, you can see some resemblance to uh, the agave havardiana, and they're both closely related species. So perii depends on where you see it in habitat. Uh, they can be solitary to few offsets around the, the mother plant to uh, big clusters of offsets, uh, big clumps with uh, a lot of offsets around the plants. So they're smallish plants on the medium end. So a little bit over two feet uh, to two and a half feet uh, in diameter, uh, but then they make nice big clusters. Here's one that's probably closer to three feet and it's more solitary uh, than having any offsets. <clears throat> this was up in Chihuahua, uh, Mexico, and this was a bigger form. So it was closer to three feet in diameter, two and a half <laughs> feet tall. Here it is in bloom. This is out in Northern Arizona. <clears throat> you can see the, the flowers the flower buds on this, if we look at the picture on the left, the buds are all red. And then as the flowers open up, we get the yellow. So I love the combination of the red and yellow in the flowers here. And again, you can see mostly solitary plants out there, uh, but occasionally there will be a few offsets on there uh, on some of those plants. When they have flowers, do they do, uh, does, do the uh, butterflies to them? Um, I, you know, I haven't seen butterflies around these plants. I've seen hummingbirds and bees. Hummingbirds. Yeah, hummingbirds and bees have been a very prevalent. Mm, the bigger. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I suspect butterflies may go test them out, but I just haven't visited. I haven't seen them mm -hmm. visiting the plants. There are uh, other agaves, like agave palmeri, is very important for bat pollen for the bat pollination or for bat mm -hmm. populations uh, because the bats get nectar from the flowers and uh, the bats will migrate. And you'll see this as the flowers, as the plants bloom from north to mm -hmm. south, south to north, the bats will migrate following the, the plants flower, uh, as they flower. Mm -hmm. And there's a big push here in Southern Arizona to plant more uh, species that are bat pollinated to keep the bats, bat populations going. Uh, so agave palmeri is one of the, the key characters or key plants in that, um, in that sense. I have a question. Uh, uh -huh. Does, when this one flowers, does the plant then die? 
Yes, and we can see on the, the right hand picture here, mm -hmm. if I look at, you can see that one's, the leaves are starting to die off and you can mm -hmm. see right back there, you can see that one that has the old flower stalk, it's been cut off or chewed off uh, and the rosette's dead. And the one next to it, that one's dead as well. So yes, that one will die. Now for the most part, Perry, I will offset so you'd have the offsets carrying that area through in the landscape, but you would have the dead, the dead leaves in the middle of the mm. the uh, cluster. When the agave have offsets, is it from the root? Does the root travels and then bloom, and offset, or good. is it pollination? Uh, good question. Uh, they're rhizomes, so they come. From, oh, rhizomes. Yeah, so they'll come from the the stem, the underground stem part. Uh, so it looks like a root coming out, and it throws this rhizome out. And then we can see, like on this one here, there's a new uh, plant coming out there. Uh, so yeah, they're rhizomatous, is what happens mm -hmm. on something like this, and something like this striata that we saw earlier you would see, if you can see my cursor here, you would see new plants forming like in the leaf axles themselves. Mm. Okay, large agaves, 48 to 60 inches or even bigger, even bigger than that. Uh, Atrovirens can get close to 10 feet in diameter. So that should go into the extra large super size category there. Let's look at a couple of these. So here's Atrovirens. It's a big green one from uh, down in Oaxaca. And you think, oh, Oaxaca, that's a southern state. It's going to be no frost tolerance whatsoever. But this grows up at around eight, 9,000 feet elevation. And I had one out in my, my yard uh, for three or four years. And it took the cold, no problem. But I think it was this past summer. It was just too hot and too dry. And uh, I tried to keep it moist with some water. And I may have killed it from too much water. Yeah, um, that's sad. With that, yeah, it, it was sad. That happens. So it it does happen. Yeah, we, we're, all, we're all learning how to grow yeah. things still, especially with this changing climate. It's just really uh, frustrating to think you you understand something and then it changes. Like this last summer, um, I don't think I got but an inch of rain uh, mm. all summer long, and you know, we should be getting six inches of rainfall in the summertime. So it was very difficult to, to gauge, you know, how much water do I need to give it and, and mm -hmm. uh, Gotta wait. Know, to keep it alive. Yeah, so it's a very you difficult. Out and put it on top. <clears throat> um, so atrovirons, like I said, can get very big. So this one's uh, actually probably 10 feet in diameter here from leaf tip to leaf tip. And this form has a little bit silver uh, color to the leaves, blue silver. So I do have some of these growing. A friend of mine in the, the uh, Bay Area, he had some, he had one flower and it produced some, some offsets. So uh, he sent them mm -hmm. to me and I'm gonna try it out again. And hopefully we can keep it growing this time. But it's a really cool plant. So the next one, Agave Gentrii, this one gets to be really good. This is my friend, Scott Calhoun. Uh, now he's 10 feet tall, so you can see how big the plant is. Yeah. <laughs> he's 10 feet tall? <laughs> really? Yes, yes. And if you believe that, I have some uh, <laughs> swamp, swamp land in Florida to sell you. Yes, uh, no, like Scott, Manhattan, Scott, Manhattan Island. <laughs> yeah, Scott's a little over six feet tall. So these plants are, are a good size. Yeah. I mean, uh, the plant. Is, the plant is probably plants, about five feet tall and mm -hmm. about seven, seven feet or so in diameter. Um, Do they uh, grow slow? Like that, that plant, that size, would it take like 20 years to grow to that? Yeah, big? yeah they're, they're not speed demons let's put it that way uh it would take this is this particular one that he's looking at is probably 20 or 30 years old yeah <clears throat> and this one's an interesting one if you look behind his back here if you can see this 
There we go. See that plant there? Look at how long and skinny those leaves are on that particular plant back in the background there. So mm -hmm. var variable plants, but these were growing up with pines and oaks. And we were going to hike up to, to see um, Agave Montana that was at a higher elevation than this. And I'd looked at a, a Google Maps and I said, Scott, you know, we, we can only drive so far, but you know, it's only a couple of miles hike there. Well, <clears throat> a couple of miles if we could have flown there would have been okay, but we had to go around the mountain and we hiked for about two hours. And I don't think we were a hundred yards closer to our destination. So we ended up not going all the way there. Uh, I'd love to go back and hire some mules to, to take us up to the top of the mountain and see mm -hmm. more things on the way up there. But, uh, these are really cool plants and gentry eye has a lot of different forms uh, so we'll look at a couple of them here <clears throat> this this is one that uh, you drive right past these these guys here there's a road that goes uh, right through the spine of the Sierra Madre Oriental which is in Nuevo Leon and you go right down this uh, middle of the mountains and you can see these incredible plants growing out in open fields Sometimes they have these really cool little uh, ripples in the leaves. Uh, you can see it on this one over here on the left. If we look at like that leaf there over there, you can see those cool ripples uh, here too. <clears throat> Greg, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, as I look at these plants, they're so, they look like they're protecting something something delicious. I mean, all of that armament and, and enclosure, there must be things that want to eat them but are prevented. Are they delicious in the middle besides uh, the tequila plant? Yeah, eventually they, they do have uh, the liquid in there that, that is kind of sweet. Um, and the locals down in central, <laughs> South Central Mexico will cut the core and it'll produce this, um, what they call agua miel. And they'll scoop that out and it'll produce that for oh, four or five or six days. And they get this sweet uh, juice out of, out mm -hmm. of it. Um, so it's probably a, a lifesaver in a dry climate mm -hmm. um, um, if you could get to it. Yeah, maybe, uh, but <laughs> I wouldn't try and rely on it, no. Uh, but a lot of the agaves, uh, I've noticed that pack rats uh, will eat some species and not others. Uh, deer will browse the plants. Um, cattle will browse the flower stalks and deers will cut out the flower stalks as they're coming out because they're really uh, delicious at that point. And then uh, the locals will cut the flower stalks and feed it to their cattle as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <clears throat> what, ha what happens with the agaves, why they only flower once in their lifetime is they'll spend that 20 or 30 years or longer developing all of their, uh, their energy reserves. So all the sugar, and that'll all go into the one big mass of inflorescence that we see. So yes, it becomes very tasty at that point. Uh, but there are chemicals in some plants that make them not palatable uh, to be browsed by animals. Here's just a young agave gentry. I, again, very stiff uh, leaves uh, that you don't want to fall into. I mean, it's mm -hmm. got that very uh, lethal terminal spine. Uh, the big teeth on the leaf edges uh, make it somewhat difficult to pull the, the pine needles out from there. So you need a leaf blower uh, to get mm. those out if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to clean them up. I like the looks of that, having the pine needles there. So I don't take my leaf blower down to Mexico and blow the leaves out. Mm. <clears throat> uh, just another agave gentry eye here. Again, you can see how stately the plants are. And when the plants flower and mm -hmm. start to die off, uh, for agave gentry eye, just a few species will do this. Agave gentry eye, Montana will do this. They'll lose all of their chlorophyll in their leaves. And mm. the other 
uh, colors, the anthocyanins, the reds, oranges, and purples will become more visible at that point. So it's basically mm -hmm. like if you're from back east and you've seen the uh, like the fall leaf color, that's kind of what's happening here. This is their death leaf color. Uh, it just it doesn't happen in the fall. It happens when the plants flower. So we have a few pictures to look at here. Here's one that went yellow mm -hmm. on us. Um, agave marmorata. This is another really cool one from uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. <clears throat> I, I think this one's a very sculptural plant, and it's really interesting. Is it's very uh, easily identified by the way the leaf unfurls from the cone here. I don't know if I have a really good shot of, of that or not, but you can kind of see how this leaf is starting mm -hmm. to, to cool. un, unfurl rather than just pull away. Uncurl. It kind of, yeah, uncurls, the edges pull off and then it, it pulls away. Mm -hmm. And beautiful flowers on this one, very golden yellow flowers on agave marmorata. Agave Montana, uh, this is one that grows at very high elevations in northern Mexico, northeastern Mexico. <clears throat> Sometimes they'll have these really cool white markings on the leaves, other times nothing at all. But typically solitary plants. And when they flower, they're just incredible plants. Mm. Uh, so you can see the different colors here uh, from the purpley red down to the yellow on the one far left here on that mm. side. This one's almost pure red. There we, go. there we go. And then the far one on the right has some purplish red and the green there. So what happens with these guys, <clears throat> they'll start to produce this flower stalk in the fall. The plant will stop flowering Mm -hmm. uh, for the winter time, and these great big bracts will protect the developing uh, apex for the winter. So the bracts will cover that up and protect it from freezing in the winter. And then once it warms up in the spring, that uh, central stalk will resume growth, and then flowers will come out later in the year. So okay, sometimes they're really close together, like we see here on the plant on the right. Mm -hmm. or <clears throat> they can be widespread like we see on the left ones here. <clears throat> and again, this one colors up beautifully when it flowers uh, and dies off. Agave ovatifolia. This is one uh, we call the whale's tongue agave. So these will get five to six feet in diameter and about three, three and a half feet tall. And they have this beautiful blue silver color and a bunch of leaves. Uh, for us, they do need a little bit of shade. And I suspect for you guys, uh, as you're starting to get hot, they'll need a little bit of summer shade as well. But beautiful landscape plants. Mm. And again, like we saw in one of the agave gentry eyes, sometimes they'll have these cool ripples in the leaves. This was my original one in my, I had two of them in my backyard. They flowered out after 13 years and I never got any seed on them, which is mm -hmm. disappointing. So typically, let me go back one. Arg, <laughs> where is it? It's hard to see that one. So typically they're solitary plants in habitat, uh, but I've grown some from seed and in pots, they do produce offsets. And I've been, been able to propagate them from offsets. So every time I uh, mail order out a plant, if it's got offsets, I'll pull the offsets and I can uh, propagate more plants that way. <clears throat> so yeah, they are uh, usually, and I've taken those same plants that have produced offsets and put them in the ground and they, they don't offset. So I'm not sure if it's something for, uh, with container culture that's causing them to produce those offsets or uh, if I just happen to, upon a, a handful of plants that were genetically disposed, disposed, is that right? Disposed to producing the offsets. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. here we've got the agave ovatifolia. So with that, um, those are some of my favorite agaves. 
So I'm going to hire you all. We're going to go landscape my new house down in Mexico. <laughs> I saw this one up in, uh, in Chihuahua, Mexico, and I thought, oh, that'd be a perfect house to, you know, just a little fixer upper. I love the fact that it's got the, the natural the cave, the man cave over here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, the back of the house just, uh, you step out the back and there's a 200 foot drop off. So uh, <laughs> if, if you have some guests that stay a little too long, you tell them to go out the back door. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's a little fixer upper. How long ago was that taken? Oh, I went down there. I think that was 2010. Ah. Yeah. And it's still mm -hmm. in the same shape, I'm sure. I haven't been back to visit it yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that's it for, for the, the uh, presentation. Again, here's my contact information. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, um, email me. Uh, for some reason, the, the shipping on the website was more than intended, and I haven't figured out how to fix that yet. So contact me directly uh, through the website, and um, I'll just figure out the shipping, and uh, I could give you a total price. and you know, do a, if you use PayPal at all, that's usually how I get, get my money. I do is a uh, request for money through PayPal or Venmo? just send, send you an invoice. Um, so, do you yeah. use Venmo? I have not. No. Okay. All right. Um, Greg, this was amazing. Does anybody have a final question for Greg? No, but I have a final comment. Your photography is lovely and I'm you made me go want to go out and, and shoot more agaves. So did you a good job for us. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes. Shoot them only with your camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <Yes. laughs> I have a question for you, Greg. Did you uh -huh. show us a photo of Palmeri? You were talking about bat pollinated agaves. I, I didn't write them all down as you spoke, but was Palmeri shown? Palmeri was not in the presentation. It is in the book, uh, okay. but it was not in the presentation. I had I'm... to draw the line someplace, but yeah. <laughs> okay. How big is Palmeri? So it's a, a big plant. It'll get five feet in diameter, five to six feet occasionally. Okay. So, yeah, it can get pretty good size. Uh, now there is a dwarf form that I, uh, presumably it'll stay dwarf. I collected seed off of one in Arizona here that the plants were only oh two and a half feet in diameter or three feet in diameter. Does so the dwarf also attract bats? It should, yeah. It has similar flowers. So okay. I would I would imagine that it would be the same bat pollinated. And I think some of these others as they like the peri eyes, they probably uh, the bats probably go to them as well. I just okay. don't know that anybody has studied um, those like agave perii and the bat um, combination. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Any mm -hmm. any other questions? While well, we still well, have, you know, I do have um, a question. I'm a little confused. As okay. far as when the do the the agaves flower every year? No. No. The, the one one plant will not flower repeatedly unless it's like the agave striata. Now that, that one, because it forms big clumps, that, that can flower re repeatedly. But for the most part, 98% of the plants, uh, when that plant flowers, that rosette's going to die and will have no, no way of blooming again. <clears throat> so it saves up its, all its energy for the course of uh, 10, 15, 30 years, mm -hmm. puts it into that, that one big flower stock. Because I'm looking to plant, possibly plant agaves in my parkway. And I don't want plants that are constantly dying. So that it would take them a while to get to that point. Right. Look for the longer lived ones. How much space do you have in the in the parkway? Um <laughs> actually I don't know. It's a typical parkway. It's then not five, wide. Five feet wide. Thank five, you. Five feet. So you could grow things like agave perii. Um, you could do agave shadigra, uh, things like that. So measure measure the area and then start with that and 
and you know go through the book and say okay i need this size agave or narrow it down to what size you want to start with thank you uh-huh i have a, another question greg uh -huh. um miriam's uh parkway question made me think of this i our, our California natives do not love water at the wrong time of year, and they'll just die on you. So I'm wondering, um, if I give agaves more water than they're accustomed to, are they going to run their life cycle faster and flower sooner and, and die out? So in general... Yes, once it's in cultivation, they're typically faster growing. So I think their life cycle is going to, to go quicker. Some will do that faster than others. Fa their, their fasterness will be faster than other fasters. <laughs> if, that's, if that's a way to describe it. So for example, like octopus agave, um, I've seen them bloom out as quickly as four years. And other people will grow them more slowly. And they've said, oh, I've had it for 12 or 14 years and it hasn't flowered yet. Mm -hmm. So I think the amount of water you give it, the, the amount of supplemental water you give it will also affect the growth rate. Uh, one thing I, I never do for agaves in the ground is I never fertilize. Mm -hmm. So they don't need it. Uh, no sense in putting fertilizer on them. You'll just speed their growth up uh, by doing that. So put them in the ground, get them established. And then if you want to grow them more slowly, uh, water less frequently, <clears throat> but they'll still need some water through the summertime. Yes. Great. All right. I, I so Thanks. appreciate your presentation today. Um, oh, sure. Uh, that's all my questions, but uh, does anybody have one more question for Greg before we let him get back to work? Anything specific to, to growing the plants? I know I don't always cover those. I don't have a, uh, a, a checklist of things that I try to cover. So if I've forgotten something, I'm, I mean, we try to cover the, the exposure. Most of them can take full sun. Some <laughs> will need a little bit of shade. We talked a little bit about watering. The soil, uh, I don't, when you plant it in the ground, uh, you don't need to do anything specific to the soil unless mm -hmm. you have um, a soil that does not drain. Like clay. So, yeah, if you have a heavy clay soil, then you can do a couple of things. You can dig a bigger hole. So the root systems on agaves are typically not very deep, but they're mm -hmm. wide. So they may only be a foot deep, but they could be three two, three, four feet in diameter. So you could you could just raise the bed or you can do a raised bed. If you have a heavy clay soil or caliche soil, uh, you could just move the plant, you know, a couple of feet. I know out here in, in Tucson, I've dug holes and it's like I hit a pocket of caliche. I move it two feet and there's no caliche. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, thank you uh, so much. I have one last question, Greg. Uh -huh. At your nursery, do you sell agaves for shipping? If we found uh -huh. something interesting and communicated with you. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I have the website uh, of star-nursery.com. Mm -hmm. And that's where I've got all the stuff up for sale. So okay. You can check that out. Check it out there. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I got a question. The last uh -huh. one. Uh -huh. um, uh, like around Palm Springs uh, area, when we drive out there to Joshua Trees, okay, have you noticed that are there uh, patches of growing agave? Yeah, there's agave desert eye out there, and there's beautiful patches. And I heard from a friend yesterday, and he said he was out there in January, <laughs> and mm -hmm. some were blooming even that early. But yeah, they make beautiful large clusters of of uh, gorgeous blue gray uh, mm -hmm. leaves and rosette. So uh, that's a spectacular agave. Uh, so desert eye is a really nice one. I covered that in the book as well. So going, taking a trip out there is worth it. Oh, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much you. for joining us today. Sure thing.
I enjoyed thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Greg. Thank you, Mr. Thank Tark. You. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Greg. Uh -huh. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. So, if uh, if you want to stick around here, I'm looking for my agenda. Um, we are, I wanted to remind you, we're going to have a speaker next month uh, talk to us about encouraging insects in your garden. Mm -hmm. That sounds counterintuitive, but it's not. Um, that will be a very interesting talk, I think. Um,